we're going to go ahead and get started, uh, make up uh, a little bit of some time here, um, while we wait for one of our speakers to come in. So who's all for getting started? Yay. All right. Majority rules. Okay, let's do this. Um, so this is a session is best practices for pr producing AR applications. And um, Kachum is, is up first. Uh, David, uh, CEO and co-founder. Whenever you're ready, sir. Uh, AB says we're good. We're good. Take it away. Good. Hello, everyone. So I'm David, uh, CEO and co-founder of Kachum. For those who don't know Kachum, uh, we provide tools uh, like image recognition in the cloud and uh, content creation through a web browser. So you can deploy your augmentations uh, through Crafter, which is our pr flagship product. We have been around for um, three years, and we are a spin-off of Telefonica, a large telco operator. What I'm going to um, speak about is strategic planning for AR implementations is a big, big topic. I would say I won't cover it at all. Um, but I want to go through what I think is like raise awareness about the many aspects that uh, can influence the success and probably ask a lot of questions rather than giving you all the answers. So here's my pickup of the five steps of strategic planning. So I think that uh, one of the first steps is understand the required technology for what you're trying to do and its limitations. And then also the, the audience and in which context they will consume uh, the content that you will produce. Then, of course, there's a step of preparation of this content and decide how it will be distributed, which is a part that sometimes is ex it's ignored. And then, of course, plan the launch and think ahead how you will measure the success of this campaign. So let me go through a few of those. So in terms of technology, I think there are kind of three axes where we can split the importance of technology and how you look at it. One is location, the other one is post-tracking, and the third one is cloud services. So in terms of location, um, I'm going to not enter too much into that, but you might want to think if you will be using GPS sensors, beacons, or what do you need if it's important in your context to use the location of the user. In terms of post-tracking, for those who don't know this terminology, what this means is to be able to relate the device that is um, capturing the reality with the actual reality. Okay? So it, it measures this uh, 3D transformation between the wall and uh, your display or, or the way you render the information to the user. I will tackle this uh, slightly. And the third one is cloud services because you can leverage on the cloud if you need to enhance the capabilities of what is on the device right? When it's, whenever it's connected. So in terms of post-tracking, the, the idea that I want you to keep in mind is that each scenario requires different technology. So the fact that there are the object that you're enhancing or that you're interacting with has different properties will pretty much align with different technologies. So whether it's flat, probably would be a 2D tracker, cylindrical, it depends on the type of cylindrical object it is, freeform, say it's a sculpture, um, whether it's textured or not, the texture plays a very big role. And when I mention texture, what I mean is that um, so if you think of a painting, a painting has full of a lot of texture. So visual, there, there's a lot of visual information that we can leverage on to know exactly where the camera is or the sensor is with respect to that. Whereas an engine has no texture. It only has parts that are ironed or whatever uh, material. But for the camera, it has to de uh, depend on other kinds of visual features to track that object. Now, if you're shopping for vendors, you will have to know what, are, what is the type of object that you hide and the, the type of computer vision typically based uh, tracker. Then I also mentioned beyond known. What this means is imagine you start with a known object, but you need to expand to other objects around you. So yesterday, if you were at the Ogis, probably you saw the IKEA um, uh, case. So you would put the uh, IKEA magazine on the floor. It starts there, but then you can move around and create a scenery where you can start putting furniture. Um, so let me give you a glimpse of when this fails. So it is an awesome case. I think it's a lovely case from, from IKEA, and, from, and I give that to, to Metayo as well. But um, it can break. So actually, one of the limitations of that technology is that if the user moves sideways instead of rotating around the object, it breaks because the technology is not able to cope with that. Okay? But this is not necessarily known neither to the user nor to the agency who brought the technology in, right? But the technologies know that. So make sure that when you go to a vendor, you ask specifically if the user will have to move in a certain direction or what, what exactly will be required in terms of technology. And I mentioned light emitting because I, I encountered a case last uh, week of a person who wanted to be able to point at light bulbs and know how much electricity it was consuming. 
Now, you find a vendor that gives you technology for that, please tell me, because that's really challenging. So just keep in mind that uh, each scenario requires different technology. In terms of uh, cloud services, it's kind of obvious, but um, the drawback of using the cloud is that you need internet connection, right? So you have to bear in mind whether this internet connection will be uh, necessary for you in terms of the place where you run this, whether it's an indoor uh, site that has no internet connectivity, or the internet connection is not, um, so the, let's say the application is not suited for internet connection. So if you're deploying something for kids and parents are um, substantially sensitive to the fact that this device is connected to the internet and then they will be able to browse, probably you will need to cut out this internet connection. But the advantage of having internet is that then you can pl do plenty of things. So you can enlarge the volume of interactions, so not only have the scope of the device, you can have remote storage, so this will play a role in, in distribution. I will talk about this in a minute. You can connect it with a CMS, an ERP, etc. And of course you can provide analytics, so you can track the success of what you're doing. Um, moving on to the uh, steps of strategic planning, um, this is about audience. I will not talk extensively about audience or segmentation or all the three um, things that you would probably need to do, but just give you a couple of ideas. So if you're producing an application, it's possible that it has multiple audiences at the same time. So if you do an app for a sales representative, for instance, in a I don't know, pharmaceutical um, sector, you will probably have this person go to a physician and show some products, right? You have two consumers at the same time. You have the sales rep that will be trained and the physician who will not have never seen that. Okay? So you'll have to think about the application in a way that it works for both in terms of practices so that the, the sales rep will, will be able, you will be able to train this person, but the physician will also need to be wowed by the uh, concept and find interesting value for that. Thank you. And in terms of uh, comparing the first time user versus the recurrent user, think about both at the same time. So the first time, of course, will be wowed, but we want to move away from this effect and we really want to provide some value. So think about this first time user as a conversion towards a recurrent user. Um, in terms of uh, context, so contextual services at large have uh, plenty of, let's say, knowledge around it. I won't talk about all that is possible in terms of contextual services, but just give me, let, allow me to give um, a few glimpses of that. So the, in terms of space required, um, I want to mention a case in, uh, that uh, guys were doing a game in the subway, and this game was, uh, so the trigger of this game was uh, in a billboard on the, on, the, on the wall of the subway. Now to play this game, you had to step back, okay? So now imagine if the railway is here and you have to step back and you realize this the day of the launch, you have a big problem. So think about the space that you require for this. Um, in terms of adaptation of uh, content to mobile, this is uh, very simple, but if you're uh, having, for instance, an application that leads to a purchase process, and this purchase process is online, you better have this landing page adapted to mobile, because otherwise it will break. You will be producing a very fantastic application, users will have them doing, done the effort to download that, but when they arrive to the real key point, which is buying, they will not be able because that website is not adapted to mobile. And the third one is internet access. I was mentioning uh, the problems uh, related to coverage and also the problems related to parental sensitivity. In terms of uh, content distribution, I would say this is probably one of the uh, topics that I wanted to emphasize more, is how big is the application that you will create. <coughs> this application will matter to the user if it's too big and they have to download it on, on a mobile device. So if you're thinking, for instance, about using Unity, think about how big the, the framework itself occupies and how much you will have to add up to that. Um, also, if you think about content distribution, think about things like uh, whether you will need to uh, recurrently change this content. For that, definitely you would want to use the cloud so that you can stream uh, content uh, uh, online. Now, how do you download? So if you're assuming that you, you say, okay, I will leverage on the cloud because I don't want a big application, um, will it be asynchronous or synchronous? So at the moment they download the app, it will, will it immediately start synchronizing? So will you cut that first experience by synchronizing all the content or you prefer it that it streams in the background so that the user is not um, uh, stopped by that? And also decide whether the user has to actively say, I want this extra content or you decide for the user whether uh, this is the case or not. 
So a couple of uh, concepts more in terms of launch and KPIs this is quite obvious. Um, I think the next uh, talk will also talk about uh, this, but um, provide a clear call to action and tell the user what's going to happen. So if, it's, uh, if they are going through a subscription process, tell them that this is what they will do because you're asking them an effort of taking the mobile phone and pointing to, a, to an object, right? <laughs> Campaign promotion, this is very important. Big brands tend to think that because they are so big, people will download their, their app. And if there are big brands here, this is not the case. So either you spend uh, money on advertising for downloads or you do a big campaign that triggers that download. So people just by seeing the call to action on your products, even if you ship millions of them, they don't necessarily will download that application. And third, of course, analytics. I think this industry needs analytics, needs to know how successful a game or, an, or a uh, utility application has been by using AR. So think about that. And last but not least, um, so I think I wanted to give you a couple of takeaways. So think carefully about the application that you're building and all the steps that it will go through from the, let's say, the moment you sell it, to sell it, sorry, to the moment it's in the hands of the user and after that, so whether it's uh, recurrent use. So think about the underlying technology, content, audience, and context. And last but not least, I wanted to kind of push this idea that augmented reality is not uh, the end goal, it is a channel to distribute something that is valuable for the user, so move away from gimmicks and provide actionable augmented reality. Thank you very much. All right, and that is an awesome way to end that, move away from gimmicks, uh, that's great. And so uh, questions from the audience. Ah, oh, we have one, all right. What is your... Uh from Catchoom, what is an example of uh, an app with the most utility made with your uh, application? And if you could, David, repeat that question, please. Yeah, so the question is, if I understood well, an example that uses Catchoom or that has been, uh, let's say, powered by Catchoom, uh, where this, is, this provides a utility. Um, I want to mention the case of Glamour. Um, Glamour decided that they wanted a branded application. They didn't want to share their stuff with um, like in, a, in an air browser. Glamour, sorry, Glamour is a, magazine, a fashion magazine for women. And um, what they wanted is to be able to connect three things that they already had, a website, sorry, a website, an existing application, and a printed magazine. Okay? So to do that, these are three independent initiatives that with a single application they could bridge the gap between them. Now for them, the use case for the user is that you can scan pages and lead directly to online shops. What happens in, in these magazines is that they um, select, for instance, accessories, plenty of them, so in a single page um, you have a lot of choices. Now to lead directly to an online shop, and uh, that's kind of the importance. And in that place, the mobile adaptation of the landing page played, played a role. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Come to our booth, by the way.